Greetings. Hi, I'm Pastor James Brooks, pastor of Mossheim Central and Otway United Methodist Church. I believe the message today will bless your heart. And I want to say please click on the share button down below. Let this message get out to as many as possible. I am sure that the word of God is needed in these times that we live in. I want to say thank you to all those that are watching these videos who do not attend our local congregations. I know of many, even up in Michigan, who have been watching our messages, even overseas, and I pray that this message blesses you. So let me ask, do you like to fish? I hope you do. But the question is, why do we keep fishing? Why do we keep going to our favorite fishing hole? Or why do you even use the word a favorite fishing hole or a good fishing spot? It's because we know that we're going to get a bite there. That we're going to, hopefully, uh, we've always been successful or prosperous in that location. And we're hoping if we go again, not only will we catch a fish, but we're hoping that maybe we've heard that there's a big one in there. Or we're hoping the unknown, the uncertainty keeps bringing us back. I want to talk about the Word of God briefly before I get into the message. Isn't the Word of God the same thing? Many times we read a passage, we've heard it in Sunday school so many times, we've heard the lectures or pre sermons on it so many times, but why do we keep reading the scriptures? Why do we keep reading the same parables, the same teachings of Jesus, the same letters of Paul, the same stories in the Old Testament, Gideon or the David and, Lion, uh, David and Goliath or Daniel in the lion's den? Why do we keep looking at these things? I'd like to submit to you, they're like fishing holes. Yes, they're familiar to us, and yes, we've been there before. But there's maybe something under the surface that this time, coming back, we're going to catch it or see something that we hadn't seen before. Let me ask you, how do you feel right now about the Heavenly Father? Does God want to reveal more of himself to you today than yesterday? Does God want to bless you with more revelation, more illumination, more of that relationship with him today than yesterday? If that is the case, if you believe that truly, that is why we go to the scriptures. Because we believe that God will reveal to more, us more of himself and will become more and more transformed in the, in the process. Today's passage has such a nuance. It's a passage of Jesus healing, but before we jump into it, it's about nuance. You know, I watched a TV show last night or on YouTube or whatever. And the lady, they gave her some baklava, which is uh, a dessert, usually like in Turkey. And as she's eating it, the bet was that she couldn't name off the ingredients. So as she's chewing and eating it, she's naming off all the, the, the little herbs and things that she can taste in it. And then she actually says where in Turkey, like eastern part, it was made or brought from. You know, we have wine connoisseurs, and their specialty is that they can you know, slosh the glass around, they can smell it, and then they can take a sip and they can begin to tell you the, the elements that are in that wine, you know, whether it's got, I don't know, jasmine or whatever is growing in the earth, they can taste that. And we see that as being aristocratic or refined, being distinguished, knowing something. But let me ask, why is it that we praise those things in secular culture, but we don't want to praise it in biblical culture? Meaning, why is it that we're okay to be like brute force when it comes to the scriptures, just like a battering ram. Jesus said, don't do this, and so we don't do it. But we never want to look any further to see what other minerals have, are growing in the soil of what Jesus is saying or teaching. Many of us, I'm talking about lay people, don't even own a commentary or a biblical encyclopedia or even an atlas or any type of biblical work. We, you, we have nothing to help us to look into the soil. Why is that? You know, they say that baseball is a thinking man's game. I could, I could never appreciate why people bunted in baseball. The, think, the, the brute would be just get up and knock it over the wall. But you know, sometimes you can't always depend on that or, or get a home run, but what you can do is do a bunt. There's thinking behind it, why you switch out pitchers, even though the one that's throwing has still got some energy in him, but he's a left-hander and there's a right-hander coming up or the other way around. I'm not sure how that works, but you know what I'm saying. It's, there's thought to it. In many things, we put our mind to it. And so let's look at the scripture today and let us draw out some of that nuance that the text is talking about. This is from Luke chapter 17, verses, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. 
as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lift up the, lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And, when, and he fell at, on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, Were not there ten cleansed? Where are the nine? No one, no one, uh, sorry. No one, no, was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This passage has a lots of nuance, and I want to get to it, but I don't want to belabor the point. I want us to look at Jesus and to look at the lepers just for a moment. Looking at Jesus, where was he going? He was on his way to Jerusalem. This is not long after the transfiguration where Jesus reveals himself to the disciples. And it says around that pot spot that he set his face towards Jerusalem. Why would he need to set his face towards Jerusalem? Because now Calvary is in his scope. He is going not just to teach or preach, he is going to die. That's what's on the mind and the heart of the Son of God. We know that it was burdensome to him or a lot of pressure on him. We read of his account in Gethsemane, how he would sweat drops of blood. The capillaries in his face and forehead would, would, would burst and there would be blood in his, in his sweat ducts and they would come out. We knew that it was on his mind. Listen, friends, I know that there's a lot on your mind. I know that you're worried about your jobs, you're worried about COVID, you're worried about your own health issues, you're worried about circumstances in your life. Like Jesus, you have a lot going on, but we cannot allow our circumstances to get our eyes off others. We must always be others-minded, looking for the pain and hurt in other people's lives. Jesus could have said, listen, I've got a lot on my mind. I'm about to go save the world of their sins, yours included. I don't have time right now. His disciples could have shooed everyone off. He could have acted like he didn't hear them crying out. He could have said many things. Not today. I'll catch you tomorrow. Maybe next time. Whatever the case may be. But the son of God who's got the, way, the world on his shoulders has time to stop for the least, the last, the outcast. He stops to minister. Listen, there's the aspect that we must learn from our Savior. Our lives also will keep us busy keep us preoccupied, keep us in things that are of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're viable. We have to work. We have bills. We have our own personal problems. Yes, true and amen. But that does not excuse us from ministry. So like Jesus, let us look to others. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Now let us look at the lepers for a moment. You know, it says that they were unclean or they were unclean. doesn't mean that they were sinful. just means that they were ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. They could not go into the holy places, the courtyard, the temple, inside the temple, anywhere of that nature. You can read this passage here in Leviticus 13, uh, four, 45 and 46. Anyone with such a defiling disease must, be, must wear torn clothes. Let the hair be unkept, um, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. If you were a leper, this was your plight. Or any type of skin malady, this was your plight. To live outside the camp, to dress in rags, and to cry out unclean, and to cover over the lower part of your mouth, lest somehow you cast it. You know, we're wearing masks these days with COVID. We might as well walk around saying unclean, perhaps. But the point being is that they were outcasts living alone, not to be in the assembly. I don't know how you picture your life, but imagine being alone. Imagine not being able to marry, to be able to be with your family, to go to the house of God, to be excluded from things. And not only that, to remind everybody by wearing torn rags so they can visibly look at you and see that you're a leper. If they didn't hear you crying it out, they could definitely look at you because your hair is disheveled your appearance is disheveled. 
So you look the way you feel, or is it the other way around? The point being is they were cast out. And because they were unclean, it became to be a stigma of a curse. God had cursed you, which isn't the case, and that's not what the scripture says. It just simply says you're ceremonially unclean. It didn't say anything about your moral uh, attributes, whether you were a thief or a liar or a robber or anything of those nature. You could be an upstanding person. You just simply had a disease. But through time, people began to look at your raggedness and associate that as a curse. And so we must not look at people that way. Those people that are maybe bound to alcohol or drugs, those people that are born in a certain economic situation who have not been taught or raised in the way that we have been raised with the virtues or the, or the idea of saving money or whatever the case may be, but rather to see them as God's creation. And so these people are unclean and they're segregated from society and they're felt, made to feel worthless. See, Jesus saw them, but what did he see? What do you see when you see your fellow man who doesn't go to church? Do you see his nice car? Do you see his nice house? Do you want those? Do you covet those things? Do you respect him because he looks the apart? He has the appearance? But do you not know that without the blood of Jesus Christ, he is he's unredeemed? How do you see your fellow man? If we do not see them as they are, how can we expect to minister to them? See, that's the heart of ministry, seeing people as they are, accepting them as they are, and then offering Jesus Christ to them because Jesus would like to make them so much more. In the text, we see that as, they're coming, as Jesus is coming close, they cry out with a loud voice. This is one of the first of the nuances or the jasper or something in the soil I want you to see. They cry out with a loud voice. They're saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us, or, or unclean, unclean, have pity on us. This idea of pity is to, um, or mercy, there's the, uh, it means to have compassion or forgiveness tor uh, towards uh, an enemy or towards a person in, uh, that you have power over. Also to feel sorrow towards another the, of their sufferings. This word co or calm compassion to suffer with. And so they said, Lord, look at our situation. See us as we are and feel something about it. Be stirred in your heart about our plight. Don't just simply walk by and give us the, without giving us the time of day. Have compassion. Step into our shoes for a moment, son of God, and see what it's like to be in our shoes. See our loneliness, our rejection, our raggedness before society. Step in and do something about it. That was their call out to the Lord. And it says with a loud voice, the, the, the actual Greek word is megaphone. Megas and then phone, which is sound or voice. With a loud voice, with a megaphone, they cried out. Listen, do you hear the cry of the people? It's not going to say, hey, preacher, uh, uh, save me. Or next door neighbor, hey, save me. They're going to cry out in other voices. I just don't know what to do. They're going to say it like, I'm just so not happy. I'm not satisfied. They're going to say it in many different ways. But do we hear the cry? They're crying out loud. Do we hear the cry? And it says that Jesus saw them. That's the second nuance. So the first one is crying out which we're going to revisit. He saw them. And I've already talked about this. We need to see the people. We need to see the need and not be fixated on our need. Many times as we pour out, God pours into us. When we minister to others, the Lord ministers into us. Many of us are stagnant because we're still water. Mosquitoes and, and, and scum grow on the top. We are not meant to be stagnant lakes, but we are to have an outflow that the water moves, that we pour into other people's lives, and the Lord will continue to pour into us. So they cried out, and he saw them. He had compassion, and he healed them. He cleansed them. And the next thing that comes up is all ten of them went their way. 
But as they're going their way, one of them, only one saw that he had been healed. This word is to, is to consider or to notice, to realize. There are many examples of this word appearing in our New Testament, but they came to an awareness. One of the examples is Herod, when he realized he had been tricked by the Magi that, uh, that they weren't coming back to tell him where Jesus was born. He was furious, but they had, he had realized it dawned on him. The light bulb came on in his head. And as those lepers were going, the light bulb came on in the head of one of them. He realized, looking down, that Jesus had done something in him. Let me ask you, has the light bulb come on in your life? Do you see yourself simply as you always were? Or have you seen what the grace of God has truly done in your life? Has the light bulb come on? I'm not asking you, do you go to church? I'm not asking, do you think you're a good person? I'm not asking, do you pay your tithes and pay your bills? I'm not asking you if you would pull off the side of the road and fix someone's tire. I'm asking you, have you come to the cross of Jesus Christ and seen for yourself that God is good and that your sins are forgiven and that you are now a new creation, that God has breathed into you the breath of the Holy Spirit and behold, all things have become new. Have, has the light come on? Do you realize that you're no longer your own, that you've been bought with the price, that you belong to the son of the living God. Has the light bulb come on? Or have you just received kind of a, a goodness of the sense of what the Bible has taught in the scriptures and have you gone on your own way, living your own life, looking to your own cares and your own needs? Or have you realized? And so he realizes it. And now See, here's the nuance. Jesus saw him, and then he saw what Jesus did in him. See the nuance going on? Jesus saw them, and he saw what Jesus did. I like to say he saw Jesus. Amen. And so the second nuance comes back in the play, which was our first, megaphone. Now he comes back, and the same word is used again. But before, as he was crying out in his desperation, before when he was crying out in his need, before when he was crying out in his shame of being unclean, now he is crying out in a different wo voice. He's crying out in praise and thanksgiving. The same voice that was used to cry out his problems is now the same voice he uses to cry out his praise. I've heard many people say it this way. I'm going to serve God with the same or even more, the same dedication that I gave to the devil. They spent their whole life living in sin, chasing after women, chasing after money, chasing after cars and houses and, and uh, promotions. And now Jesus Christ has saved them. And they said with the same vigor that they served the world and the God of this world, now they're going to serve Jesus with the same passion. Let me ask you, have you seen the Son of God? Have you seen Jesus? Well, that, let me ask a second question. How is your voice? Do you find it hard? Is it muffled? Are you wearing a, some type of muzzle over your mouth? You can't praise God. You find it difficult to sing. You don't want to voice your praise. Oh, saint of God, I hope that's not your story. We are called to praise God. Read Psalm 150. All it does is tell us how we can and should praise God. Let me tell you, it shouldn't be a should. It should be something that just bursts out of us. Like if, I, if you were to win the lottery, no one would say, hey, you need to thank God that you won the lottery or you need to be excited that you won the lottery. If someone were to drive up with a brand new car and give it to you, you wouldn't say, hmm, I wonder how I feel about that. You would be excited. You may even want to faint at that moment, overcome with emotion. If you were to see your mom or dad that maybe passed away or a relative that you missed and you got to see them, or if your son came back from Iraq or your daughter and you got to, they come through the door, you, there's plenty of videos like that on YouTube. You see the parent, they run and they grab him. They don't let anything stand in their way. But yet, when the Son of God saves us of our, of our deadly sin, when he cleanses us of that which ails our soul, so many people put their hands behind their back and sit down on them, and they say, harumph. Now this preacher is getting all excited. Let me calm down a moment here. With a loud voice, he came back to Jesus, crying out. So he saw Jesus now. He cries out to Jesus. 
In the first one, his position was they stood at a distance. They stood at a distance. But now you're going to see something else. He throws himself at the feet of Jesus. So now he's prone and he's up close and personal. Standing at a distance, yelling out your needs. Now up close and personal, prone at the feet of Jesus, praising him for what he's done in your life. And what Jesus says, hey, this unbelieving Pharisee, this guy not even raised in church, he's not even a Jew, he came back because he saw what I did. Where are the people that you would expect to come back? Where are the other nine? Or where are the other 99? I guess if we want to talk sheep references, why is the one come back? The heathen on top of that. Yes, why are so few ready to praise the Lord? Why are so few ready to serve him? with their heart, to humble themselves, to cast themselves at the feet of Jesus. Why? I would say that because they never really saw Jesus. They saw their need being cleansed, but they never really realized the Savior. And so he throws himself at Jesus' feet, and Jesus adds this. He says in verse 19, Arise. So he lifts them up. He raises them up. Arise. And go your way. Your faith has made you well. The word well there is sozo. You probably heard of Commander Sozo in the charge of the Light Brigade. Sozo is the Greek word for saved. Your faith has saved you. Listen, we need some saving in our life. Amen. So let me encourage you see Jesus, praise Jesus, fall at his feet. And also in ministry, let us not be overcome with our own circumstances that we don't see others. I hope this message has encouraged your heart today. I love this text. I encourage you, get your fishing pole, your spiritual fishing pole. Grab your spiritual tackle box. It's right here. No, it's not. <laughs> Grab your spiritual fishing pole and tackle box. Go to the water hole and let God, who wants to bless you, who wants to reveal himself to you, who desires to grow closer you, to you today than yesterday. Let that God see you and let, may you see him. God bless you. God keep you. And God make his face shine upon you. Amen.